In this video, we will talk about the skeletal muscle structure and cross recycling during contraction. Skeletal muscle is composed of fascicles that are in turn comprised of multinucleated muscle fibers. These fibers are exactly what are called muscle cells. These muscle cells are composed of smaller myofibrils. Myofibrils, in turn, contain sarcomeres. A sarcomere is demarked by Z-lines. One sarcomere starts here and terminates over here, from Z-line to Z-line. The organization of sarcomeres within the skeletal muscle produces its striated appearance. Sarcomeres are composed of thin and thick filaments. Here is the thin and here is the thick filament. Both of them further are composed of different kinds of protein. The proteins of the thin filament are actin, tropomyosin, and troponin. As for the thick filament, the protein here is myosin. Myosin is attached to Z-line by another protein known as titin. These are myosin heads. If you take a look at zones and bands, here we see the H zone, which is composed only of myosin, and here there is no overlap between actin and myosin. Here are Z lines. The I band contains only the acting thin filaments which extend from the Z line toward the center of the sarcomere. The M line is at the center of the sarcomere and is the site at which the thick filaments are linked to each other. The A band constitutes the length of the myosin on either sides of the M line. Myosin thick filaments are found in a dark A band. In a nutshell, contraction occurs when myosin binds to actin and pulls on the actin filament. Contraction causes the sarcomere to shorten and shortening of the I band and shortening in H zone, but contraction causes no change in the length of the A band. Let me draw here a section of muscle fiber and add an important point. The membrane which covers the muscle fiber is called the sarcolemma. In some places, the sarcolemma invaginates to form the tubules. These tubules are called the transverse tubules or T-tubules. It is very important to note that T-tubule membrane are extensions of the surface membrane, therefore the interior of the T-tubules are part of the extracellular compartment. Right here we have the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is part of the internal membrane system. One function of the sarcoplasmic reticulum is to store calcium. It is very important to note that in skeletal muscle, most of the calcium is stored in a terminal cisternae close to the T-tubule system. The terminal cisternae of the sarcoplasmic reticulum make intimate contact with the T-tubules in a triad arrangement. And now let's talk about these steps in excitation contraction coupling in skeletal muscle. Excitation contraction coupling is the process by which a muscular action potential in a muscle fiber causes the myofibrils to contract. Now I will see step by step how the action potentials cause the release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. This release of calcium plays an important role in contraction of the muscle. Here we see the sarcolemma 
and as I already said, it invaginates and forms T tubules. Here is the extracellular environment, and here is the cytosol. This represents the sarcoplasmic reticulum. In skeletal muscle, most of calcium is stored in a terminal cisternae of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is close to the T tubule system. The sarcoplasmic reticulum has a high concentration of calcium, and thus there is a strong electrochemical gradient for calcium to diffuse from the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the cytosol. Now, there are two key receptors involved in a flux of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the cytosol. Dehydropyridine and rhinidine. Rhinidine receptor is located in a sarcoplasmic reticulum and it is referred as a calcium channel. When skeletal muscle is at rest, the rhinidine receptor is physically connected to the dehydropyridine receptor located in the sarcolemmal membrane and is blocked by them. Although it is a voltage-gated calcium channel, calcium does not flux through this receptor in skeletal muscle. Rather, DHP functions as a voltage sensor. Now, there are five steps involved in calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum to the cytosol. First, skeletal muscle action potential is initiated at the neuromuscular junction. Second, action potential spreads across the surface of sarcolemma and down the T-tubular membrane which are continuous with the surface membrane. Third, the voltage change causes a conformational shift in DHP, removing its block of rhinidine receptor. Fourth, removal of the DHP block allows calcium to diffuse into the cytosol down its concentration gradient. Please note that electrical gradient doesn't play an important role here because the membrane is depolarized by now. This is a passive transport and doesn't require ATP. Fifth, the rise in cytosolic calcium opens more rhinidine receptor channels by a mechanism known as calcium-induced calcium release. Next, let's talk about cross-bridge cycling and the role of free cytosolic calcium in this process. In order to clearly understand the cross-bridge cycling, let's first talk about the sarcomere in detail. Sarcomeres are composed of two types of filaments, thin and thick. Both of them are composed of proteins. The proteins of the thin filament are actin, tropomyosin, and troponin. Actin is anchored at the Z-lines. It is important to note that actin has the special sites at which myosin heads attach and initiate contraction of the muscle. But under resting conditions, when the muscle is not contracting, these points are covered by another protein which is called tropomyosin, which in turn is regulated by troponin, another functional or regulatory protein. Troponin is a complex of three globular proteins, troponin T, troponin I, and troponin C. As for the thick filament, it is composed of myosin, which is bound by titin. Myosin, which is in the center of the sarcomere, has two heads attached to a single tail. Titin is another protein which anchors myosin and is an important component of striated muscles elasticity. There are four major steps involved in cross-bridge cycling in a contracting muscle. In order to make it easier to understand, I will draw a single cross-bridge of sarcomere. These represent Z-lines, actin, and here is the myosin. In a first step, which is the resting state, the myosin is in a high energy and affinity state. It loves to bind with actin. 
The only reason it doesn't bind it is because of tropomyosin that covers the attachment points for the myosin head. As I already said, depolarization opens rhinidine receptor channels and cytosolic calcium rises. This free cytosolic calcium binds to troponin C, exposing myosin binding site on actin. In the second step, the myosin head binds to actin and forms a cross bridge with it. Third step, once myosin binds to actin, the chemical energy is transferred to mechanical energy causing myosin to pull the actin filament. This generates active tension or active force in the muscle and is commonly referred to as a power stroke. In the fourth step, which is the dissociation stage, a molecule of ATP attaches to the myosin head, causing the crossbridge to detach. Binding of ATP to the crossbridge head causes the myosin to enter a state of decreased energy and affinity. Next, the hydrolysis of ATP puts myosin in a high energy and high actin affinity state. It is extremely important to note that ATP is not required to form the crossbridge linking to actin, but is required to break the link with actin. When a cycle ends, calcium is pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum by a calcium ATPase on a sarcoplasmic reticulum membrane called sarcoplasmic endoplasmic reticulum calcium ATPase. The fall in cytosolic calcium causes tropomyosin to once again cover actin's binding site for myosin and the muscle relaxes, provided of course ATP is available to dissociate actin and myosin. So two ATPases are involved in contraction, myosin ATPase and sarcoplasmic endoplasmic reticulum calcium ATPase. Cross-bridge cycling or contraction continues until either withdrawal of calcium occurs, which returns the muscle to the normal resting state or ATP is depleted. Following death, the muscle cell becomes ATP depleted and there are no ATP activity. Calcium leaks from the sarcoplasmic reticulum and attaches to troponin to form a cross-link between the actin and myosin and the muscles contract. But no ATP means the crosslink will not break. This is the state of rigor mortis. And lysosomal enzymes eventually break the link to terminate the state of rigor mortis.